What did Jehu do to the sons of Ahab? This is the question we seek to answer today as we continue our verse by verse study of the book of 2 Kings on walking through the Bible. Today we're going to be discussing 2 Kings chapter 10, verses 1 to 11. But before we do that, let's read the passage. If you have a Bible with you, turn to 2 Kings chapter 10, verse 1. But if you don't have a Bible, don't worry. Just follow along with us on the screen. The version that we'll be reading from is the New King James Version. So 2 Kings chapter 10, beginning at verse 1. Now Ahab had 70 sons in Samaria, and Jehu wrote and sent letters to Samaria to the rulers of Jezreel, to the elders, and to those who reared Ahab's sons, saying, Now as soon as this letter comes to you, since your master's sons are with you, and you have chariots and horses, a fortified city also, and weapons, choose the best qualified of your master's sons, set him on his father's throne, and fight for your master's house. But they were exceedingly afraid and said, Look, Two kings could not stand up to him. How then can we stand? And he who is in charge of the house, and he who is in charge of the city, the elders also, and those who reared the sons, sent to Jehu, saying, We are your servants. We will do all you tell us, but we will not make anyone king. Do what is good in your sight. Then he wrote a second letter to them, saying, If you are for me, and will obey my voice, take the heads of the men, your master's sons, and come to me at Jezreel by this time tomorrow. Now the king's sons, seventy persons, were with the great men of the city who were rearing them. So it was, when the letter came to them, that they took the king's sons and slaughtered seventy persons, put their heads in baskets, and sent them, sent him to Jezreel, sent them to him at Jezreel. Then a messenger came and told him, saying, They have brought the heads of the king's sons, and he said, Lay them in two heaps at the entrance of the gate until the morning. So it was in the morning that he went out and stood and said to all the people, You are righteous. Indeed, I conspired against my master and killed him. But who killed all these? Now know that nothing shall fall to the earth of the word of the Lord, which the Lord spoke concerning the house of Ahab. For the Lord has done what he spoke by his servant Elijah. So Jehu killed all who remained the house of Ahab in Jezreel, and all his great men and his close acquaintances and his priests, until he left none, left him none remaining. We're now in a period of transition in Israel. Jehoram, the last king of the line of Ahab, is dead, having been killed by one of the commanders of the army, Jehu. Jehu was anointed king by God before doing this and told that he was going to administer God's judgment against the house of Ahab for all the evil that Ahab had done. This judgment had come by the words of the prophet Elijah back when Ahab had allowed Jezebel to kill Naboth so that he could obtain Naboth's vineyard. Along with Jehoram, Ahaziah, king of Judah, and Jehoram's nephew, is dead, as is Jezebel, Jehoram's mother. But even with these people all dead, and even with Jehu having been anointed king over Israel, that didn't mean that it would automatically be smooth sailing for Jehu from here on out. Jehoram would have had a son, and if he didn't, he would have had another brother who would have been next in line to the throne. For chapter 10, a verse, uh, for in chapter 10, verse 1, it says that Ahab had 70 sons, which in this context means sons, grandsons, even great-grandsons. If Jehu simply allowed them to live in peace, there was always a chance that one of them would rise up against him at a later date. And so Jehu sent letters to Samaria, to the rulers of Jezreel, to the elders, and to those who reared the descendants of Ahab, in other words, those who raised those who would have a claim to the throne, to select the best qualified, to set them on the throne of Ahab, and fight Jehu in order to determine who would be king. When these people received the letters, though, they knew that anyone in line to the throne would be no match for Jehu, for Jehu had slain two kings already, as well as the queen mother, who had been thrown down to her death. Certainly, all that waited these men would be certain death. In order to avoid this, these people wrote to Jehu that they would not make anyone king, but would be your servants and do all that you, that they, that you would tell us to. These people had only told Jehu that they wouldn't have made anyone king, in other words, shown loyalty, then perhaps Jehu wouldn't have gone further, but by pledging blind loyalty and obedience to him, Jehu decided to test this by commanding them to send to him in Jezreel all the heads of Ahab's sons in a basket 
by the end of the next day. And this is exactly what they did. Thus, all of Ahab's male descendants were extinguished that day, leaving Jehu as sole ruler in Israel. Was what happened here sinful on the part of these men? And the answer is, yes, it was. But didn't the Lord command Jehu that all the sons of Ahab would be killed? Again, the answer is yes. But that didn't mean that any way Jehu chose to do so would automatically be approved by God. Jehu didn't execute these men personally or as part of a battle. He got others to do so as a test of loyalty. So yes, the word of the Lord was accomplished, but this didn't absolve Jehu of any method he chose to accomplish the will of the Lord. For his part, though, Jehu used these men's death as a way to strike fear in the hearts of Israel and further consolidate power. Placing these men's heads in front of the gate of Jezreel, Jehu stood before them, admitting to the fact that he did conspire against and kill Je Jehoram. But who killed all these men? It wasn't him, conveniently leaving out the part where he ordered that these men be killed. What Jehu is saying here is that he wasn't the only one who wanted the end to the house of Ahab. Others did too, thus absolving himself of any animosity that some might have held against him. And what's more, Jehu uses all these people's death as a testament to the fact that the word of the Lord was against the house of Ahab as spoken by Elijah the prophet. And as is clear now, nothing will stop the word of the Lord from being done. And while this statement is true, Jehu's motives in executing the word of the Lord is not coming from a righteous heart, but one of selfish ambition. How do I know? Because up until this point, Jehu could be said to have been operating within what the Lord commanded him to do in killing the house of Ahab, even if he went about it the wrong way. However, he used that mandate and the people's fear of that mandate to expand upon what the Lord had said to kill, all, all, uh, said to kill in that he killed all who remained in the court of Ahab, his great men, his friends, his priests, until nothing is left. That last part was not commanded by the Lord. That was Jehu acting and acting alone. Now, why would he do this? Because he wanted to remain king. No matter that God had made him king, and as long as he followed God faithfully, he would remain king, Jehu didn't trust in that as his later actions will reveal. No, instead, he wanted to ensure by his own might and power that he would remain king in Israel and that nobody would dare cross him. In this, we see the difference between Jehu and David. Like with Jehu, David was anointed king over Israel as a result of the sin of the previous king. But unlike Jehu, David allowed God to bring about judgment on the house of Saul in his own time. He did not personally go out and kill the Lord's anointed. And even after Saul died, David didn't slaughter the court of Saul in order to establish himself as king. He knew God would keep his promise and establish him on the throne of Israel. His job was to walk righteously and leave God to do the rest. Jehu, though, was no David. He was a warrior and a mighty one at that, but he was not a man of faith, as we will see later attested to by the author of Second Kings. If you mark your Bibles, though, I would like you to place a highlight in verse 11, pointing to Hosea 1, verses 3 and 4. For when we get to our study of the book of Hosea, the events recorded here will become important for us to remember. Jehu is not done, though. What will he do next? We'll find out the Lord willing in the next lesson. With that, our time is up for today. The Lord willing, we hope you'll join us for tomorrow's discussion of 2 Kings chapter 10, verses 12 to 17. As we continue our walk through the Bible, one verse at a time. I'm not a Thank you for watching today's episode. We hope that you found it edifying and ask that you not only subscribe to our channel and podcast, but that you like and share this episode among your friends so that the saving gospel of Jesus Christ can go out to the whole world. Of his cross.